Okay, this should work now, I hope. And, okay, a couple quick announcements. You have a test, a quiz. It's like, I don't know how many questions. I made it as basic as possible. Cold War in the 1950s, my guess is you're gonna have a pretty easy time with it. One short ID, just a quick little essay, not a big deal, but we still have to do work. We still have to keep rolling on. And by the way, I hope you enjoyed these first few minutes. And uh, I'm gonna have to go through and I'm gonna cut off the me looking at the sound. But I did promise a couple songs here. And so since I had So I know what you're thinking. It's been a long time, a long time since December when we back when we're used to meet this building called school. And you miss limbo. Well, we're not gonna have limbo, but from the same artist, and I know this is gonna be exciting. The same artist. Let's see if this works. It doesn't work. Wow. Yeah, I don't get this either. <laughs> My internet is like, I think everything is just shut down to nothing. It's really not gonna work. Okay, well, just imagine I played music. This is really not gonna work. Oh, the hell with it. All right. <laughs> Best laid plans. For some reason, my internet is really slow. I don't even know if this is working, if you can see me or not. This is one of the fun parts about working at home. I have no idea if anything works. And I set this all up, and then something freezes, and I have to go back. Now I'm whining. All right, we'll see if this works. I'm gonna try one more time with the music. Well, I'm not gonna try the music. We'll get back to this. All right, so let's go and get back where we finish. All right, we have a quiz. The notes are gonna be due at the end of the week. I will do the same thing next week. I'm gonna sign a few, uh, make a few assignments. Everything I'm gonna do for the rest of the year will be done by next week, next Friday, May 29th. But then the week after, I'm still gonna have class uh, for a few days and then uh, take a day to tell stories and that's it. So. Let's go ahead and get going on this. Sorry about that. I will go and cut this off when it's done. I'm a little, eh, just a little annoyed, but not too bad. Okay, so I went through Kennedy's election uh, the other day and talked a little bit about uh, Eisenhower's worry about the military industrial complex and these cheesy memes that people make. But it is true. He was very concerned about the fact that military spending would take away money from what was really necessary and the fear that a cabal of arms manufacturers and politicians would exaggerate the Soviet threat and also with more money and power that they could get from exaggerating it will lead to more war. And this he would of course be ignored. And this one we had U2 crisis, Cuba, etc. Yesterday we watched The Rage Within which is one of the great videos of that era. And the big thing about The Rage Within uh, the best videos of uh, about that area. The best thing about the Rage Within is that it it really does a good job of showing the fact that so much of this issue about uh, Jim Crow laws and the racism involved is that mo uh, to many mainstream Americans, and that means not just whites, but people get their their information from the media and the press, they didn't know or didn't know the extent of it. And this forced them to understand. This also gets back to one really key point, why history is so important. If you don't know your past, clever politicians, clever demagogues, people who want power will use your ignorance against you, convince you that what they want has always been that way. That's what the founders wanted. That's why they always pull out quotes from Jefferson or Lincoln. And that's why they do that. And that's what's so effective about the civil rights movement. And it made people get out of their myths, the reconstruction myth, the gone with the wind myth, and realize what has what is happening. But it's shocking how fast it goes back. 
<laughs> once you saw the beginnings of the civil rights message, all of a sudden, Confederate battle flags went all, all over. Why? Because they wanted to believe that Reconstruction myth. And so one more thing about this. Don't forget two things about this. First off, is that Plessy versus Ferguson back in 1896 said, separate but equal is constitution, constitutional. Brown versus Topeka, uh, uh, Topeka Board of Education, <coughs> which it's unfortunate. They just didn't go all out and just say, hey, separate but equal is unconstitutional. Uh, it was a mistake looking back at it. But instead they just did it for schools. But they said, segregated schools are inherently unequal because the reason they are separate is racism, is the idea of white supremacy and blacks cannot be in the same school as whites. It has nothing at all to do with the quality of the schools. Nothing, it's that. And that's an important fact because one of the things that Southerners, Southern states and segregated states would do is when they realized this might become an issue, they begin to pump money, not a lot, but pump money into these horrible schools that were segregated only for blacks with the idea that hopefully maybe they'll just say, hey, that school's better, everything's equal. And people say this all, this is a big issue now. There is a huge, massive qualitative difference between schools in poor neighborhoods and schools in wealthier neighborhoods. It's shocking. Those aren't equal schools. They're inherently unequal. And yet what happens? Well, it's the way it is. Maybe we'll get a little bit more money, but it doesn't change the facts are inherently unequal. We don't really get that in Montana because we're so small. <coughs> Excuse me as I cough. Ow, allergies. I hope. All right. So let's go ahead and get then to Kennedy. JFK is now president. And the thing about... Miles is on the wrong thing. Okay. Kennedy is president. And the big thing about Kennedy as president, the big thing about Kennedy as, sorry, is he came in with this aura of youth and vigor. He's the youngest man ever elected president. Now, don't forget, when I say youngest man ever elected president, he's not the youngest man ever to become president. Teddy Roosevelt was younger, but remember, he became president after McKinley was uh, gored to death by a wild boar. And so with that, with that, Kennedy is president, and they really pushed this idea of youth and vigor and the glamorous atmosphere of this new president compared to the, uh, you know, the, the more stale and seemingly plain administration of Eisenhower. So they really pushed the glamour of Kennedy's wealth and power. And a lot of Kennedy's wealth and power came from, you know, his dad, having a lot of money and buying them that that idea and also shows that um, the idea of glamour is really just a made-up image too and remember Kennedy is very ill but when he came in I'm gonna give you an example of the speech Kennedy gave and the big thing about this speech was this is just one line that all of you probably heard and this is what people remember but then I'll play a little bit more but these very you know these stirring words but was there substance behind the words so let's get to this And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And that actually came from the JFK Library. And that real feeling of Kennedy is he's going to come in and all together we'll make this country better. Now, this one thing about Kennedy, regardless of anything, and do put this down, when I put down the New Frontier, that is going to be the name of his program, write down that this was his idea of liberalism, to finish the New Deal and Fair Deal, that all of us together can work together to make a bigger country, a better country. Let's say bigger, better. Let's go with better, to make a better country. And that was the liberal idea from, from FDR. Well, this goes all the way back to liberal presidents. You go all the way back to, you know, from Lincoln, then, you know, to even Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Truman, this idea. So this is not, I'm going to get rich in the heck with the rest of you. He really wants to push this idea. Now, did he mean it? That's another thing. But 
let's get to this and then I'll play one more little bit of speech and my speech, I put it in there, it kind of covers the New Frontier, but that's this program. By the way, New Frontier, kind of new deal, right? New, but now new for the 20th century. And even though he is very liberal, he's significantly more liberal than, um, than any, uh, the, the two people running for president now. Uh, but it's not quite as, not quite FDR. So what he wanted was increased funding for education, but not going all the way to free college tuition. This is more direct aid for K through 12 education. And so he was stepping back from what Truman and FDR wanted. Lyndon Johnson would push for that, but uh, Vietnam. He wanted a higher minimum wage. The minimum wage had not gone up <coughs> throughout the 1950s. He wanted very targeted tax cuts, but he wanted them Keynesian tax cuts. So they wouldn't necessarily, even though they dropped the highest, he wanted to drop the highest marginal income tax rate a little bit. He wanted to make sure that they actually would pay more. These were geared to try to give more tax or put more money in the hands of working people. He also had an anti-poverty initiative. Despite the massive affluence, the poverty rate was still 20, over 20% 20 of the population. Uh, we're a little below that now, but poverty is much higher than it was now than let's say when, when I was your age. So that's what he wanted. But, and so this very much fits in with the new deal, fair deal ideal. But then the other parts were much more, to say the least controversial, but also the keystones, civil rights. He wanted, well, he did a lot of talk about civil rights but it really wasn't until that fall that he began to push for civil rights. And that would begin to shake, finally break apart that democratic coalition in the South because of equal rights. He also wanted healthcare for the elderly that would be called Medicare. Now remember FDR and Truman both wanted national health insurance for everybody. So all people want access to healthcare regardless of their job. Well, under the Eisenhower administration, well, I'm sorry, Truman couldn't get that because of pure blatant racism. Southern Democrats didn't want, well, conservative Southern Democrats did not want blacks to have the same health care. Uh, and that's when the Eisenhower administration would make uh, health care tied, kind of permanently tied to your job, and which we still have today, which is now with uh, 40 million people just uh, losing their jobs in the last nine, eight weeks. This is a, it's a crisis. And, but he wanted health care for the elderly. So this is a stopgap method. And then massive increase in defense spending, ignoring what Eisenhower wanted. And he called his program, unlike Eisenhower's new look, flexible response. And what was flexible response? It would combine conventional weapons with nuclear weapons. So emphasize not just nuclear weapons, but emphasize tanks, planes, iron bombs. So build up conventional forces. Remember, Eisenhower went to cut back on that because he thought it was a waste, and he covered this by focusing on nuclear weapons. So Kennedy says, I will have a much more dynamic system. So uh, yes, we'll have nuclear, but focus more on that, but also on counterinsurgency, coin. Build up the United States forces that could either fight guerrilla wars against communists or other guerrilla ar armies, or train countries to fight them. A brand new branch of the armed forces that came out of the Rangers, which were copied from British commandos to do uh, special operations and behind the line stuff. And they were called the special forces. And they were um, created in the late, late 1950s to be involved in counterinsurgencies, but more importantly, to train um, soldiers of other countries to fight counterinsurgency. And Kennedy loved them. By the way, everything in the military copies the French. This is a Napole influence of Napoleon to the Napoleon to this day. Did I say Napoleon? Napoleon. And they wore distinctive caps, aka berets. And thus they're called the Green Berets. So with that, up, 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 where are we at here? Okay, so that's the new frontier. Kennedy had this dynamic program. But Kennedy turned out to be a relatively unskilled legislature. Remember one of his great appeals. He didn't have a legislative record so they could create an image. That's great for running for president, but that's not the same skill as getting bills through Congress. And he turned out to be a disaster at that. 
He could speak gl in glowing terms, give a great speech, was charming and clever, but at the same time, it never really, is it working here? Okay, good. It never really, <coughs> excuse me, allergies, I hope. Uh, it, it did not appeal to legislative bodies. He could not get Southern Democrats on board. The Democratic Party was very split. And even though it had huge Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate, he got virtually nothing passed. If you look at the new frontier, all of his major programs, education through Medicare, none of those were passed. Civil rights, a disaster for Kennedy. He talked a good show and never pushed it. The only thing Kennedy got was defense spending. The United States would begin the largest peacetime military buildup in its history up to that time. President Reagan would pass this, and I don't even know, we're a constant war now, but it's a totally different world. Yeah, and this is what he would brag about for his whole presidency. He had so many uh, disasters, but he could be the cold warrior. He was a cold warrior to stop communism. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. And so with that, Let's listen to a little bit of Kennedy's speech. Ignore Let the word the go forth from this or time music. and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed. Stirring words, brilliantly delivered, but and he didn't write them, of course, he had a speechwriter, a man by the name of Ted Sorensen was a brilliant speechwriter, put these words together. Nothing wrong with having a speechwriter, it plays his image, but it's also, think about for a second, yes, it's these soaring words about sacrifice and coming together, but think about in the terms of the Cold War. And to which we are committed today at home and around the world. This is Truman Doctrine thinking right here. I don't know why they go back and forth. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Wow. Listen to that for a second. That is a Cold War speech. And he is doing pure Truman Doctrine that um, we are going to defend our allies everywhere against our foe. And everybody knew what that meant. The Soviet Union and, of course, Com um, Red China. And so when he's come in, he's making this Cold War speech that I will be tough on communism. And the problem is, what if they call you on it? You make these soaring words and let's say the communists win. Or let's say the communists have an enclave 90 miles from the American shore. But... While this is going on, remember the space race? Kennedy came in with NASA being created and the United States is energetically building rockets to now get a satellite, but now the big race is to get a man into space, to get a man into space. The Soviets got the first man into space, Yuri Gagarin, and the Soviets got the first one and it looked like they had a clear advantage, but actually the Soviet rocket system was way behind. The United States had some technical issues, but the United States, as I mentioned before with the missile gap, they had ICBMs by this time, the U.S. did. And so the U.S. began this space race with the Soviet Union as a big Cold War measure. Who can get up into space first? Who can get a man into space, a man into orbit, satellites, because everyone saw this more than just simply a weapons program or satellites maybe spying on your opponent, remember the U-2, to which system is better. And Khrushchev was desperate to show that the Soviet system will survive and work. And so the United States 
kind of reluctantly <coughs> would get involved at first with a um, well first to set up a satellite and then the big thing was to send up something that would live the russians were the first one they put up a dog poor laka um laka would become a national hero and but of course laka never made it back down i think you know what that means the u.s got a monkey into space but then the soviets got the first man and this would eventually lead to it's called the mercury program and the mercury program was they very carefully chose seven young uh, pilots and all with college degrees with the idea of being look how advanced American system were, were um, was and these would be the first men into space and Alan Shepard a Navy pilot would be the first US per um, first uh, US citizen into space the Soviets got the first one Yuri Gagarin now his space launch was really pretty basic they just went up into the atmosphere then back down they the, they're still having problems with the rockets but uh, it would be a couple flights later that John Glenn, who was, right, this is John Glenn in his space capsule. It's called Friendship One, and if you ever get to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, you would not believe how small this capsule is. He orbited the Earth in this tiny little thing. But John Glenn is right, where's my mouse? Right there. John Glenn. And he would become a national hero. And he was the most photogenic and and charismatic of all the astronauts and they wouldn't let him back into space he would eventually go back up into space on the space shuttle in the 1990s uh, he has since passed away he's a long term he was a long time Sen democratic senator from ohio but that's a space race and while this is going on let's add one more thing and can well i'm jumping the gun here so that's a space race and we'll come back to this but this is going to become a major factor of the cold war while this is going on, the Bay of Pigs. April 1961, Kennedy inherited a program by the CIA to have trained insurgents. And most of them were former thugs from the crooked Batista regime that Castro ousted. That kind of jumped the gun there. The Bay of Pigs was a plan to trigger a popular uprising in Cuba. For some reason, I didn't write down Cuba. But make sure you get that down. Trigger a popular uprising in Cuba. This should remind you of something, of Guatemala. And they would train this, um, with mostly Batista thugs, this army. And the thought was they would land at this little bay right here, south of Havana, on the southern shore of Cuba. And the assumption was that the people of Cuba would rise up and overthrow the dictator Castro. And they all thought that they were experts in the CIA because of what happened in Guatemala and Iran. In fact, they even trained in Guatemala, which might shock you. <laughs> no way. Yes, of course, because we put in a dictator in Guatemala. And so they would go here and then they would actually, um, the CIA would find these old freighters and give them to the, uh, to this guerrilla or this uh, insurgent army of freedom fighters who would overthrow the Castro regime. Now, I got to be clear about it. They really were a bunch of thugs and criminals and ne'er-do-wells. It was a motley crew. And the, the CIA um, piloted planes for them, most of the old World War II era planes, and the ships. But they all acted like this was a homegrown army like they did in Guatemala. And to a lesser degree, I ran in other places. Well, it didn't work at all like they thought. When... <coughs> The CIA's forces landed. The, the Bay of Pigs turned out to be a horrible place to invade. It was surrounded by swamp. They, were, um, they couldn't get off the beach. Castro's men, and here's Castro at the front. I love this picture of Castro with the big horn rim glasses. Castro, oh, you can't see it. Well, my picture's big in this, isn't it? Let's reduce my size. There. So there's Castro. And... He, uh, he went to the front. They quickly surrounded it. There was no popular uprising. In fact, the people wanted nothing to do with the Batista regime. And they easily pushed back, uh, not only easily pushed them back, but forced them to surrender. The CIA knew this was a good possibility, but never told Kennedy this. And there was a U.S. Navy task force, including aircraft carriers, off the shore. And they went to Kennedy, just 
hours after the invasion and said, it's not working, we need the Navy to bomb. Basically saying, let's start the war. And Kennedy realizing, oh, this isn't gonna work at all, said no, did not use US Navy airplanes, which would escalate it to who knows what. And the invasion failed. This was a disaster for the Kennedy administration. It was one of those things, it was a no-win situation for him. If he didn't do it, which actually he did not like the whole entire idea of this invasion. He didn't like it, it didn't, didn't sit well with him. But if he didn't do it, he'd look weak and then get blamed for it, for not doing anything and letting Castro survive. And all that popular rising, um, um, the rising rhetoric of his inauguration would be, would be taken for what in many ways it was, empty talk. But then if he did do it and it failed, he blamed, he's blamed because he's the president, regardless of it, it was under the Eisenhower administration. I should add, Kennedy liked these kind of Clattison operations. He thought they were great. He thought, he thought it was fun. But he wanted it to be his operation, not Ike's operation. So here's a failure, and Kennedy, who liked to smoke cigars, thus you get it, the exploding cigars. And there's a shot of the Bay of Pigs. It was a total failure. And when we look at it, a couple things we got to get. He's going to be blamed, but he would blame the CIA. And he would try to go outside the CIA then to try to get rid of Castro. But you can imagine how Castro felt. The U.S. wants to be gone. And I put plus there, but basically what I mean by this is Cuba and the Soviet Union got even closer together. And Castro demanded weapons. And he realized that there, I might be invaded, there might be an enemy within, and Castro would adopt total war. And who knows what kind of person Castro would have been. We have no idea if Castro meant what he um, said back in 1960 when he talked about um, a real democracy, a social democracy, where all people have rights. If he meant that or not, it's irrelevant. After the Bay of Pigs, Castro worried about the U.S. invasion. It's going to become a totalitarian dictatorship under total war. Remember all those steps I told you of breaking dissent and doing all that? He went through it all. He might have done it anyways, but that's what the state is to this day in many ways in Cuba. And so with that, ironically, just two months afterwards, a summit had been planned in June of, of I thought it 1861, 1961 in Vienna, Austria. Austria then was technically neutral, but Kennedy and Khrushchev were going to meet, and it was a horrible disaster. Here are two pictures from him, and yes, it's all smiles in the pictures. The cartoon kind of shows the test of nerves with the mushroom clouds, because both sides began testing weapons at an accelerated pace after the U-2 went down, and Kennedy continued it. Got to look tough on communism. Kennedy, after Cuba, really wanted to show he was tough. And he knew he had the reputation of a lightweight. He also knew that Khrushchev was going to think he's a lightweight. So Kennedy was going to go in there and look and act tough. Khrushchev infuriated hit, uh, at the U-2 crisis. He was still so mad about this and mad at the United States that he felt he had to look tough too. And he thought he could browbeat the young, inexperienced Kennedy. And that's what happened. They went back and forth at each other. And when, they, when this ended in June of 61, back on into J of July of 61, the Cold War looked worse than ever before. And I love this picture of Kennedy. Um, basically, any dangerous spot is tenable. Brave men will make it so. Wow, I mean, we're talking wartime rhetoric, and then the same magazine, communism, how can we fight back, implying that communism is winning. And this really feeling in the United States that we're losing the Cold War. The big thing that Khrushchev bashed Kennedy about was Berlin. Berlin's this divided town now, East and West Berlin. <laughs> town, this city, it's a little bigger than Helen. And you know, this is one of the things that Kennedy was worried about if he used uh, U.S. Navy planes to help with the Bay of Pigs. Would Khrushchev swallow up West Berlin? And then World War III. And Berlin will be on the, on the thoughts of U.S. planners all the way through the rest of the decade. Much of the reason the United States got into Vietnam, Berlin. But what he was complaining about is called, we call today in Berlin, the brain drain. 
And what happened was this. Young people in the East, they were leaving the East and going, the, going to the West. How could they do this? Oh, well, and I should add, if people, young people are fleeing from behind the Iron Curtain and going to the West, how can the Soviet system work? Khrushchev wants to, wants to show the Soviet system can work. How can he do it if smart, young, ambitious people are leaving? And the reason why is this. Sure, along the border of East Germany and West Germany, it was difficult to cross that border. All kinds of border regulations and armed guards, and pretty soon uh, an electronic barrier with guard dogs. It was incredible. But in Berlin, here's a map of East and West Berlin. This line right here was open. This is just an occupation zone for the Soviet Union, and here's the French, British, and American occupation zones. It's open. People could go back and forth at will. And so people from all over behind the Iron Curtain, not just in Berlin, but in East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, they would go to East Berlin. Now, the Soviets tried to make East Berlin into this um, showpiece of socialism, of communism. And so they encouraged people to go there and look, look what they could do when they rebuilt it after the destruction of World War II. But all these people from Czechoslovakia or Germany or wherever they might be were going here and then crossing over to the West and not coming back. And a lot of young people. And this, that's why they called it the brain drain. This was a real threat. Now, it started with you know, just a few hundred a month in by the mid-1950s. But by the early 1960s, it was 1,000 people a month. And to stall over 1,000 people, to Khrushchev, this is a disaster. And that's why he went to Kennedy and said, you've got to stop this. You've got to control the border. Now, I should add, by saying you've got to control the border, to Kennedy, why do you want me to control the border? Are you trying to take West Berlin? Which, of course, was not at all what Khrushchev was thinking. But that gives you an idea how they just didn't understand each other, especially the United States. And so didn't understand. Uh, one thing I should add, so my, my sister-in-law married a Berliner. She lives in Berlin now. And he grew up in the U.S. occupation zone. They call it the Tempelhof region um, because it's near the airport there. And so he grew up in U.S. occupied, that U.S. occupied area. In fact, the U.S. kept a brigade of troops there until 1991 or 92. Brigades, 6,000 men. <coughs> and so when Kennedy refused to do this, Khrushchev decided I got to do something on my own to control the brain drain. And this happened in August of 1961. It happened so fast that it blew people away. So I almost forgot one other thing. What was going on was that it was a lot cheaper to live in the East than the West. Apartment rates, housing rates, was a lot more expensive. So a lot of people from the West would get apartments in the East and then just cross over to work and go back and live cheaper. And then there'd be like a part of the family living in the East, part of the family in the West. You can just imagine divided families. A lot of people, when they retired in the West, would go to the East. And so, in April of 1861, that's 18, why am I in that? I'm all messed up. August of 1961, it's in April of 18, oh wow, we're in the Civil War all of a sudden. August of 1961, little, middle of the night, normal day, people going back across the border, back and forth, no big deal, all of a sudden, boom. East German police and army put up barbed wire, but everybody knows Khrushchev is behind this. They put a barbed wire blocking the east and west zone and very quickly built a wall. And it was so fast that families were divided. Um, here are people in the west looking over on the other side. And it just was a shock when they hastily built this wall and eventually built a, a reinforced cement wall. There's only tiny pieces of it left today. And... Here's barbed wire in front of the Brandenburg Tor, Brandenburg Gate. And this East German police officer, or East German uh, officer in the army, he's holding a Russian submachine gun with sunglasses. Uh, an AP photographer must have really liked, you know, like uh, took a lot of pictures of him, like this prototypical East German communist. So there's all these pictures of him um, all over. But this um, came up, boom, families divided. Just overnight, this was... A shocking change to the US. They took this as Soviet aggression. The Soviets are now surrounding the East and making this little island or surrounding the West 
and making this island of democracy in the middle of their occupations all behind the Iron Curtain. And if you lived in West Berlin, this was pretty scary. In fact, West Berlin had, or West Germany had begun the draft, conscription, to build up their army because of the Soviet threat, which by the way, wasn't that Stalin's uh, biggest fear? I mean, West Germany would build up a massive army, one of the best armies in the world. It's a German thing. But um, young men in West Berlin did not have or were not drafted with the whole idea being we'll encourage them to stay in West Berlin and not free, not flee to um, flee to the rest of West Germany to keep the population up. And so the Germans, which um, Germany, which did not end their draft until just 15 years ago, um, if you lived in, um, you know, they still drafted young men, but not if you lived in West Berlin. And I should add that since I mentioned my, my sister-in-law married a Berliner, he was just out of high school when the Berlin Wall went down and they started drafting him. So it was his, he was the first um, group of young men from West Berlin that were drafted into the army. So back to this story. Here is a family. This is looking over at their grandparents who are on the other side of the wall, divided now by the wall. Yes, it looked hastily built. This wall would come down in a much better wall. Here's a famous picture of an East German guard making a break for it and jumping over the barbed wire to freedom. What a great picture. And he did make it, but they would kill over a thousand people who tried to flee to the, to the West. But it might look like Soviet aggression, but was it really? If you have to build a wall to keep your people in, your system has serious problems. And it, this should have been a red flag to the United States that the Soviet Union's in real trouble. In fact, if they would have gone on a charm offensive with the Soviet Union and ended really their only reason to exist, and that is to protect the people from the evils of the West, they might have fallen apart right there. But instead, we saw it as massive Soviet aggression, but it was actually Soviet desperation, pure desperation. This tells you a lot. The Berlin airlift was a little bit of this too, but Berlin would be on everybody's mind. And so here's the divided city with the wall. And then all around the western edge of West Berlin would be barbed wire. And then there would be three, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> three autobahns and three railroads that would go in that were connected by land. And I've talked to people who've made that drive. They would drive through you know, from West Germany, across East Germany into West Berlin. And it was like going through a tunnel. And every exit, because it's uh, the US interstate highway system is based on the Autobahn. So the exits would be there and there would be barbed wire and checkpoints and it was just surreal. Just a surreal thing. And also that's why Berlin always was kind of insular, like an island within Germany. It's really like an island to this day. It's just different. Well, this would become the symbol of the Cold War. And the United States made a big deal that it would vow to defend Soviet aggression in West Berlin, just like they were defending the United States. And they wanted to make it very clear. The United States wanted to strengthen NATO. And so they, they were saying that if an attack happened on West Berlin, or for that matter, Frankfurt or Paris or London, it's like attacking Washington, D.C. They had to get credibility to convince their allies. They were really worried that because of the Soviet threat, and this is why uh, they were because of the Soviet threat, the West and NATO might break apart. And this was an underlying fear. Gee, Vietnam's going to fit into this. John Kennedy would go to Berlin and give one of his most famous speeches. Also misinterpreted. Now, we want to say that I, the United States, but him, since he represents the U.S., feels as we are part of Berlin, too. And so when and he said that I'm a Berliner, I'm a citizen of Berlin. And so he actually went to the mayor of West Berlin, who had become chancellor of Germany, Willy Brandt. And actually, they went through and got it phonetically right so he could say it in German to the German crowd in West Berlin. And then speak the rest, the rest of the speech would be in English. But he wanted this German bit to get the crowd going. And he there's him giving the speech. The Berlin Wall is at its back. Massive crowd. Um in the Tiergarten, which is a big park near uh, the Brandenburg Tor. 
and the Brandenburg Gate. And so here, once again, with stirring music, it's a little bit of the speech. Oops, I need my earphone then. Okay, here we go. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore... Oops, sorry about that. Therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. Berliner. You notice it's even phonetically, it's even phonetically uh, spelt out on that little, on that, um, on that uh, index card so he could get it right. And the crowd went nuts. Now, I was told this when I was school. You might have been told this, that um, Berliner is a jelly donut also. And by the way he said this, he was really saying, I am a jelly donut. And... I was told this, ah, Kennedy thought it was a jelly donut. And the thought was that all the crowd laughed and, oh, it's silly American. I was told this. I was even in Berlin and I bought a sticker that if we were, I, I brought it to school because I like to show it to my class so it's safe in my classroom. But it, it, was, a, it was a jelly donut saying, Ich bin ein Berliner and all this stuff. No, he never said he was a jelly donut. He said it using the informal Ich bin ein Berliner means that it's an informal way of that one Berliner would say it to another one. And so he was saying it as a citizen of Berlin. He did not say it as a jelly donut, but it got a bit, it's still kind of fun to say. So back to this thing. So if you heard that, no, no, no. Oh. So this is where you get then uh, this great picture from Time Magazine showing Uh, it's it's a very effective cover of <coughs> excuse me of the hand reaching over the wall imprisoned by them and more and more you get these maps of the defense of Europe and U.S. forces stand off against or NATO forces standing off against the Warsaw Pact and I would see maps like this I remember this all the time when I was growing up and this standoff in Europe and there would be a few standoffs at the Berlin Walls, tensions seem to go up. Here's one of the more famous ones. It was called Checkpoint Charlie, but that's the U.S. Army, code name that, but the U.S. Army checkpoint from going from east to west Berlin. And here are U.S. tanks from the U.S. Brigade there standing off against Soviet tanks and, over, and there were a bunch of standoffs over west and east Berlin. But in reality, in reality, tensions reduced. The brain drain ended, and so there was no more cruise ship pressure to do something about it. With the wall, the United States realized that there will be no more aggressive action. That problem is solved. And even though it did not strengthen the Soviet Union, tensions went down, and soon the wall just became this thing in the middle of Berlin. And there's a lot of great pictures of this. Of here are people from West Germany going to West Berlin and taking their picture in front of the wall, and you can see all the graffiti there. Here's them building the new stronger wall with the uh, old wall, hastily built wall with the uh, the Reichstag was literally on the border of this, and this is taken from the old Reichstag because that was still abandoned. It had not been really used since the Reichstag fire in 1933 even though there was intense fighting during the war. And here's looking back then at the Brandenburg Gate and um, the Soviets or the East Germans would put landmines and machine guns and watchtowers all along this. And you have this surreal kind of thing back and forth. Um, so the last story about my, so, uh, so my sister-in-law married the Berliner and he grew up with the Cold War and he told stories about how they would go <laughs> go to the to the wall and they would stand on cars or things like that and they would yell insults at the East German guards until they pointed their guns at them. Yes, that's crazy. But it is kind of weird stalemate, but the wall would represent then the Cold War. We're going to jump right to this. No, we're not watch Kennedy. This gets back to mongoose. 
operation mongoose then would be kennedy's way to deal with the problem of castro and mongoose was the code name to assassinate castro but kennedy no longer trusted the cia because of the bay of pigs and so ironically they ran this illegal operation out of the, the department of justice and it's a little bit shocking the nepotism here but john kennedy would choose his brother robert kennedy robert fitzgerald kennedy rfk to be the attorney general <coughs> the attorney general is supposed to be separate even though they're part of the president's administration but separate from the president um, so that law would um, the law would not be used to benefit the president for political reasons and yet here's the president's brother as attorney general so yes this was a conflict of interest and this is a problem to this day uh, that the uh, justice department sometimes appears very much to be a part of the political arm and using the law enforcement bodies of the president to actually help the president but they ran this illegal operation that was illegal not only to try to assassinate the president, but also they in, in they got elements of, here's a picture of groups from the five families in New York City, organized crime through the Justice Department that at that time was cracking down on organized crime. They enlisted the help of the organized crime to work with the CIA and anybody else they could find, former Batista thugs or whoever, to try to assassinate Castro. Why organized crime? Because organized crime built all these casinos in the 1950s in Havana. The Batista administration was corrupt as corrupt can be. And this would become kind of a playground. They would come down to Havana and go to casinos. Wealthy people from New York City would come down, for example. <coughs> Castro kicked them out. It's no coincidence that Las Vegas that was just starting their casinos uh, in the late 1940s would have their boom, which it would eventually go to this day when the mob moved from Havana and totally went to Las Vegas. Now it's all corporate, which is, I guess, another form of organized crime. Here's actually a top secret document talking about the various ways they tried to assassinate Castro. And they actually got kind of close. They got a former mistress of Castro when Castro came to New York City in, at the end of 61 to speak to the United Nations to try to assassinate him. And they tried to get some poison into um, some facial cream he had and a pistol. And she lost her nerve and actually Castro found the pistol. And in the ho a hotel room in New York City, actually handed her the pistol and walked up to her and said, shoot me if you have the guts in Spanish, obviously. But um, she did not um, do it and Castro survived there. But they tried a lot of other things. For example, he always smoked a cigar. So they actually um, tried to mine a cigar, put explosives in a cigar, and when he lit it, it would explode in his face. Yeah, ha ha. But um, the cigar, they planted it. They got someone to plant it in his private stash of cigars. It was like twice as big as his other cigars, and they realized this isn't a, a cigar, so he didn't smoke it. And ironically, at the same time, a lot of these plans were going on. Mad Magazine, which is now kind of dead, but Mad Magazine used to be a very popular com 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 comedic magazine, cartoon, you know, a set, a satiric magazine, has this of <laughs> the exploding cigar with Castro. I love that. But they tried other things. For example, he was a beachcomber, so they tried to beachcomber looking for like seashells. And they tried to mine a seashell, so they pick it up and blow up. They also tried to put poison into his wetsuit because he liked to snorkel. And they even tried to put LSD into his, um, on his wetsuit with the idea being that this LSD would make him um, also start hallucinating and act weird and lose credibility. At this time, the CIA was secretly using LSD on people unknowns to them to use it for interrogation. And it would be from there that it would get out and people started taking acid in the 1960s. That's another story. And they also tried to put in this chemical that would make all his hair fall out, with the idea being that if his beard fall out, fell out, he would lose his credibility as a as a, a revolutionary, and they kick him out of office. This goes on the realm of just comedy. But there's one more thing. They also tried to, like for example, 
take down a plane, killing everybody involved, involved and saying it was Castro. I mean, they talked about doing these things, seriously. Nobody in the United States knew about Operation Mongoose, except a small little group in the White House and the CIA, until 1976. They didn't know. There were rumors, but never knew. But who knew? Castro. And Castro's thinking, they invade and they're trying to kill me. This not only led him to more totalitarianism, but last thing for today, this is going to lead to two different things going on. Here's Castro. They're out to kill me. At the same time, Khrushchev felt weak. <coughs> he had to build a wall to keep his people in. The United States had a clear advantage in ICBMs and missiles. Here you see this right here. That is a Soviet ICBM. Soviet ICBMs, they were building them, but they were liquid fuel, and it actually took over a day to fuel them. So they could only launch as a first strike. They'd be, they were not a very good retaliation, AKA deterrence. And, and the United States surrounded the Soviet Union with missiles. They had, the US had missiles in Italy and in Italy, Turkey, and Japan that could reach most parts of the Soviet Union. The U.S. had bombers that could reach all over the Soviet Union. And the U.S. now had ICBMs. And they felt really weak. At the same time, Castro felt weak. Thus, they come together. Yes, I love the picture. Khrushchev looks almost too gleeful there in that picture. <coughs> and what both of them wanted was a deterrence. They wanted to deter an attack from the United States. And Khrushchev and the many Soviets were convinced the US would attack. Why else would they go through this massive military buildup if they're not going to attack? Why else would the rhetoric be of the United States about making all these sacrifices if they're not going to war? And not realizing that these, this rhetoric was American domestic politics, this goes back to the Truman Doctrine. Now, deterrence means to deter your enemy from attacking. And how do you do that? You have to convince, well, the Soviets have to convince the United States that any U.S. attack will be met by overwhelming force and will both be destroyed. In fact, they had a term for this called mutually assured destruction with the great acronym that is very appropriate, MAD. MAD. If you attack us, we attack you, world destroyed, so nobody attacks anybody. So this is a great cartoon from the late 1960s. And it's showing all the different atomic bombs. And you gave them Y-bomb, Z-bomb, H-bomb. Doesn't matter, you know, we're just the bombs. But since they're so deadly, it says on them, on no account to be used because the enemy might retaliate. What is the only way they're going to fight? With bows and arrows. And that gets to... The great quote by Albert Einstein, who Einstein, whose, theoretic, or whose theories helped lead to the atomic bomb. Einstein was asked after World War II, what is your prediction for World War III? As the Cold War started heating up and it looked like it might happen. And Einstein said, I don't know what World War III is going to be like, but World War IV will be fought with, with sticks and stones. That's the bows and arrows, meaning civilization will be destroyed. So. Both of them wanted a deterrence. Khrushchev wanted a deterrence from American overwhelming nuclear power, nuclear arms, and Castro wanted a deterrence from invasion and assassination. And thus we're leading to the only th last thing we're going to talk about today, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And even though the United States and the Soviet Union are, are going to come close many times to nuclear war, this is the closest, not only is it the closest um, that both sides actually knew what was going on and building up to war. Because there are a couple times that both sides accidentally almost blew the world up. In 79, the U.S. came within about two minutes from blowing up the world. I'm glad I was asleep when that was going on. But anyways, at this time, not only did both sides know what was going on, well, had an idea. At the same time, people all over the world knew. And that's why this is such a big deal. And what a great cartoon. So here's Castro and Kennedy sitting on H-bombs. See that? They're sitting on H-bombs, right? Everyone got that image? And they're arm wrestling, so this kind of silliness over the Cold War. Yet, both of them have their finger on the button. 
And so Kennedy has his finger on the button that will blow up Khrushchev. Khrushchev has his finger on the button that will blow up Kennedy. So you get this, right? Arm wrestling. So, okay. But think about it for a second. Look at the arm wrestling. Let's say Khrushchev wins. So you see how Khrushchev is? He has his arm like this. And let's say he wins and bang, knocks it down. What's he going to hit? The button he has his finger on. If Kennedy wins, where's his arm going to go? To the button. So even if they win, they lose. Nobody wins this thing. It's a great cartoon. Great cartoon. So, a U-2 flight over Cuba. Uh, October 14th, 1962. Now, the U.S. had been, been doing U-2 flights illegally the whole time Ca um, Castro had taken power. And these U-2s were just barely above air defenses. And basically, uh, the Cubans and their Soviet allies ignored them because they didn't want an American retaliation. But you can imagine how infuriating it would be. Now, these are very illegal. The U.S. would go nuts if the Soviet did it did to the United States. But the U.S. is the most powerful country. So we can do whatever we want. Right makes right. Did I say right makes? Might makes right. Sorry about that. And <coughs> on this day, it flew over. And it's very sensitive cameras picked up pictures like this. These are medium range and intermediate range, MR, BM, medium range, missile sites. Now, <coughs> they don't look like they're being operated. They're being constructed. But they believe, not only are they constructing it, but you look at those tents that they shot on the right, those are medium-range ballistic missiles. And so the Soviets are putting missiles. And everybody just assumed, which is true, they would have nuclear weapons. As a deterrence, the Soviets wanted missiles to deter an American attack, and this would also deter an American attack on the Soviets, but also an American invasion of Cuba, which after the Bay of Pigs and Mongoose, which Castro knew about, it looked like it could happen. And so they got this. And for the next eight days, Kennedy absolutely went nuts. And I think you can imagine why. No American president could stomach missiles on Cuba that could hit the United States within minutes. So short range and medium range missiles are on this CIA map. And most of the missiles were medium range. But medium range is right here. Oops, sorry about that. Do, 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 do. All right. Right here. That means they could basically hit Washington, D.C. from Cuba. Most of the missiles were that. And it would take about 10 minutes. So there's no time to do anything. A missile from Cuba and Washington, D.C. is gone. The intermediate range missiles could reach almost all the continental United States and, and big hunks of Canada, the population centers of Canada. And so. This gives the Soviets incredible deterrence if those missiles become operational. Truman doctrine thinking is that no, this, is a, this is a massive victory for the Soviet Union. A massive victory and a political disaster for the president. No president can go and run for re-election and say, vote for me and I let the Soviets put missiles on Cuba. Kennedy remembered. China. He remembered the bomber gap. He remembered how effective the missile gap was against Nixon. And he could imagine somebody coming back. Uh, Nixon, by then, was, uh, everyone thought was politically dead. He's never dead. But he would lose. And so he began to do a special committee of leading national security advisors called the Executive Committee. And, or XCOM, and they begin to meet in the situation or the uh, conference room right outside the Oval Office in the White House. And here they are right here. And here's Kennedy's Joint Chiefs of Staff. And the ch um, head of the, the commander of the U.S. Air Force was Curtis LeMay. Curtis Bombs Way LeMay was the same general who began the firebombing of Japan and also strategic air command through the 1950s that kept the United States on a hair trigger for nuclear war. And he, along with the rest of the officers, say, 
we got to go right in. We got to attack. And Kennedy got all kinds of bad or of advice, but almost all of them was were about war. And we know what happened because Kennedy recorded the conversations in ESCOM. And they're pretty amazing. Kennedy would leave and it was basically, we got to attack, we got to attack. And we'd come back and they'd have these conversations. But they all operated on the idea that this was an aggressive attack by the Soviet Union. When it wasn't. This is much like the Berlin Wall. This is an action that really was, look how far behind we are. And so with that, so the point is both sides were operating with faulty assumptions. The Soviets underestimated how the United States would freak out. They, they totally underestimated the political situation. And the U.S. didn't understand how vulnerable Castro, I'm sorry, Castro and Khrushchev felt. So the last thing for today, these are the options. <coughs> the first option was diplomacy. Foreign Minister Gromyko of the Soviet Union was coming to, he was coming to, ah, I hit the wrong button, Washington DC just four days after those pictures were taken. And so here he is at that very meeting, Gromyko talking to Kennedy. You notice Kennedy on his rocking chair. Kennedy's back was so bad that the chair he was most comfortable in was his rocking chair. And because he, he was in constant pain. Yes, the painkillers and amphetamines that Dr. Feelgood was pumping into him was still going through, but that's another story. And this would have been the time for him to say, in secret, we know you have the missiles, get them out, or this will be a public humiliation for Khrushchev and, and Kennedy. That might lead to World War III. But Kennedy decided to say nothing. The feeling was it might not work, and here's the biggie, it might look weak. If it looked like he went to the Soviets and begged them, he could see Republicans saying, look how scared Kennedy was. The Soviets are when maybe he's either too soft and weak, or maybe he's a commie, a pinko. And so they blew this opportunity, which would have been the best time, because if they make it public, they will uh, lose face. The Air Force said, let us do a surgical airstrike. We can bomb and put bombs right on those missiles and knock them out, problem solved. Well, the problem with that is they couldn't do that. They probably couldn't hit those targets and it would have escalated to a much bigger war. And then the next option was, well, if the airstrikes won't work, we invade. And they started to bring US forces and kind of trying to disguise it, but pulling in reserves to the Gulf Coast in Florida, ready to potentially invade Cuba. And the thing about it is when Kennedy looked at that, it's like, oh, God, if we invade Cuba or bomb them and it escalates, he's not, th he's not just thinking about the nuclear weapons on Cuba. He's not even worried too much about invading Cuba. He's thinking Berlin. If the United States attacks Cuba, will Khrushchev swallow up West Berlin? And he turned those down for the last thing for today. As I said, I promised. They're going to do a quarantine. They will isolate Cuba and not allow Soviet ships in. Now, they call it a quarantine because blockade is an act of war. So they called it a quarantine. See, if you use a different word, it's fine. And that is where we quit because we're coming to where they nearly blew the world up. All right. So, good place to stop. I'm sorry I had some technical issues in the beginning. It was very odd, very weird how that happened. Um, the settings just uh, reversed on my um, my studio program for some reason, and I did not change it, but for some reason it wasn't coming through. And this is where I quit for today. So then Monday, Tuesday we'll pick this up. You do have a little bit of a quiz. The notes are due. Uh, other than that, we are going to cruise along. Oh, I should add. So um, I'm not going to necessarily assign anything from the book. We're just going to do notes. And so with that. You can turn in your books. And I know that the school is, is going to send, maybe they are, maybe you already gotten it, but a thing to start planning on when to turn in books, because the time is now to start thinking about that. Get your books in, you don't want to find, don't, um, you have three books to turn in, the review book, Zen and America. 
And so start thinking about that. We still have a couple of assignments. And if you have any makeup you have to do, I'm giving you an opportunity to get that in. Now, for a lot of you, I'm starting to change your grades to a zero if you haven't turned that in. But I will change it back because I know how crazy these times are. So I'll give you a break on that. But you have to do it yourself. And if you turn in late, you have to let me know so I can make the change. If you don't let me know, I won't see it. It's a lot. It's hard enough to, to, make, um, to keep track of all kind of grades. We have a thousand papers coming in. But 